Hello, welcome to Turn Talk. I'm Shelley Easter, producer and education attorney at the Federal Judicial Center. In each eight to 12 minute episode, we discuss the terms cases that are most likely to impact the lower courts. With me today is Erin Chemerinsky, Dean and Jesse H. Choper, distinguished professor of law at UC Berkeley Law School, and Michael McConnell, former judge of the 10th Circuit, Francis and Mallory Professor of Law, and Director of the Stanford Constitutional Law Center at Stanford University Law School. Thank you both for being with us here today. Today we're talking about two civil rights cases. One redefines what reasonable accommodation of religion means to employers, and the other addresses Section 1983 enforcement of laws created under Congress's spending power. Michael, can you get us started with Groff v. DeJoy, please? Uh, yes, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits employment discrimination on the basis of a number of characteristics, uh, religion being one of them. And sh a few years after the passage of this, that statute, Congress amended the religion uh, portion uh, to provide that it is discrimination on the basis of religion uh, for an employer to fail uh, to uh, provide a reasonable accommodation of the worker's religious needs short of undue hardship. Uh, in a quite early decision uh, on that statute, however, uh, which was called TWA against Hardison, uh, the Supreme Court interpreted the language of the statute as requiring no more than uh, a, quote, de minimis uh, burden. Um, Many of us so over the years have thought that there was a big gulf between undue hardship and de minimis. And finally, in Groff uh, versus DeJoy, uh, the court uh, revisited the question. Uh, and although it didn't really tell us very much about what undue hardship is, uh, it did say that it's more than just a de minimis uh, burden. Gerald Groff worked for the United States Postal Service. He describes himself as an evangelical Christian, and he didn't own to work on Sunday. When he was assigned to work on Sunday and was written up, he ultimately quit and sued the United States Postal Service for violating Title VII for not accommodating his religion. The federal district court in the Third Circuit ruled against him, applying the TWA versus Hardison standard that Michael outlined. The court said it would be more than a de minimis burden on the Postal Service to have to accommodate his religion. It's interesting, the Supreme Court unanimously reversed the lower court. The Supreme Court clearly dramatically changed the standard, though the court didn't explicitly overrule TWA versus Hardison. Under TWA versus Hardison, the employer would not have to do more than it would be a minimal burden. Now the employer has to accommodate religion unless it would be a substantial cost to the employer. Justice Alito said that this is consistent with Title VII, it's consistent with TWA versus Hardison, though it is a dramatically different standard. So Michael, what are the takeaways from this case? Uh, so first, there's an interesting constitutional side of this that is, does not actually come up in the opinions uh, themselves, uh, but there has long been an argument that the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment uh, keeps the government from accommodating religion when that accommodation would impose a burden on a non-consenting third party. Uh, and I think there's reason to believe that that may have been motivating uh, the court way back at the time of TWA against Hardison. And the Supreme Court in more recent years has uh, backed away from that, uh, that and, and holding most recently in a unanimous opinion by uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, that burdens on third parties are permissible under the Establishment Clause, but not if they are absolute or uh, extreme that the government has to take into a, take those burdens into account. Well, an idea of an undue burden almost by definition takes that into account, uh, but this is a, a rejection of this fairly extreme interpretation of the Establishment Clause having to do with third party uh, burdens. But one more point about uh, Groff that I think is interesting is that the statute refers to uh, undue burdens on the employers. Uh, but uh, when it comes to things like Sabbath uh, observance, 
Uh, one way employers might uh, accommodate is by forcing their other employees uh, to uh, take the time to work on Sunday or Saturday, uh, depending on what the Sabbath day uh, for the employee is. The statute does not expressly refer to burdens on other employees. And so I think a question going forward will be uh, to what extent uh, requiring an employer to impose burdens on other third party employees uh, counts under the statute. If I had to point to one case in this term, that I think was the most significant effect on the federal district court and court of appeals, it's this case. There is such a huge difference between saying the employer doesn't have to provide accommodation to be more than an minimum burden on the employer, to saying the employer has to provide an accommodation unless it would be a substantial cost. This is going to lead to far more litigation. And of course, there's the question of what does substantial cost mean? That's going to take a lot of case law to define. Thank you. So there's another case that we can probably cover really quickly, um, but that had some impact as well. Uh, Health and Hospital Corporation of Marion County v. Tulevsky. Erwin, can you tell us about that case real quick? Sure. And unlike Groff versus DeJoy, which clearly changed the law, this case is significant because it didn't change the law. The issue is when can Section 1983 be used to enforce federal laws adopted under the spending clause? There are many laws adapted under the spending clause that don't in themselves create a cause of action. In Maine versus Thibodeau in 1980, the Supreme Court said 1983 can be used to enforce these laws when 1983 is available against local governments and state and local officials. There's a lot of pressure to try to get the Supreme Court to reconsider and even overrule that. And that's what Tulevsky is about. It involves federal law, adopted under the Spending Clause, the Federal Nursing Home Reform Act. And it involves a lawsuit against a local government that received money under it. And the Supreme Court was expressly asked to overrule Maine versus Thibodeau, but it didn't do so. Justice Jackson wrote the opinion for the court. It was a seven to two decision. And she said, Maine versus Thibodeau was correct. Section 1983 says it can be used against those acting in color of law, provide the Constitution and laws of the United States. Statutes adopted under the Spending Clause are laws of the United States. She also said, though, that the Supreme Court has imposed limits on this. It has to be a law that creates rights. It has to be a situation where Congress hasn't implicitly precluded the ability to have 1983 suits. But as I said, I think this case is significant in reaffirming Maine versus Thibodeau. Michael, did you want to say something about that case? Well, I would just say two things about this. One is that this decision uh, has an awkward relation to questions of uh, who whether there is an implied cause of action, that there have been a series of cases in the last 15 years uh, in which the court has uh, narrowed the idea that someone uh, who is the beneficiary of one of these spending uh, clause statutes necessarily is has a cause of action to go into court uh, to sue. The theory being that under the spending clause, the principal enforcement mechanism is a cutoff of funds. Uh, and you know this is I, 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 that's also, of course, the theory under which the uh, the parties here argued for overruling uh, Maine versus Thibodeau, uh, that uh, the the argument is that a spending clause condition, is not really a command, it's really a contract that uh, the person receives federal funds on the agreement that they will comply with certain uh, conditions. Uh, and uh, that isn't actually a command, that's a deal uh, being struck. And uh, the argument that was rejected in, uh, in, in this case was that uh, th that does not constitute a law for purposes of section 1983. But, Again, that there's some tension between that reasoning uh, and the reasoning of the of the private cause of action cases. So this case didn't change a whole lot, but are there other takeaways we can garner from it? Do I think there's a big difference between the whether there is an implied cause of action under a federal statute and whether Section 1983, which creates a cause of action, can be used. 
I don't see the Supreme Court as creating private rights of action under statutes that don't. But I do think that this case says when 1983 applies, and that includes enforcing laws adopted in the spending clause, nothing has changed. Thank you both again for being with us today and helping us work through these cases. Thank you.